Hello, everyone. Welcome to 92Y and our summer lecture series, and a special welcome to everyone joining us by live webcast tonight. I'm Jennifer Hausler from 92Y Talks, and we're thrilled to welcome the Chopra brothers, Deepak and Sanjeev, to our stage tonight. They will be in conversation with Jeffrey Pulver. We will be taking your questions on cards tonight. Just write them down, and we'll have them collected and brought to them on stage. And copies, uh, pre-signed copies of the book, um, both doctors have signed the book, and it is a, going to be for sale in the Hall of Mirrors afterwards. Um, I also want to remind you to visit our website, which is 92y.org. We're constantly confirming new events, and you can get the most up-to-date info, info by signing up for our weekly e-news. Uh, coming up, we have Alice Walker, Tony Bennett, John Mellencamp, Ariana Huffington, Ralph Nader, Martha Stewart, Jean Wilder, Chris Hayes, and many more during the months of May and June. Our moderator tonight, Jeff Pulver, is an internet tech pioneer and founder of Vonage. He's the organizer of the 140 conference, which focuses on Twitter activities and strategy. Sometimes the conference is held here at 92Y. In fact, he'll be here hosting with Malika Chopra, and that'll be on June 18th and 19th. Um, it's called The State of You, and people will be sharing their experiences about health and wellness and fitness and food. Please welcome Jeff Pulver. Uh, good evening. I am um, very, it's an honor to be here tonight and uh, I'd like to invite uh, the, the Dr. Chopras to the stage, please. Please come out. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. So, uh, welcome to the 92nd Street Y, and welcome back, Deepak. Thank you. So, um, we're here tonight to talk about the book you've, you've written together, our Brotherhood, and I, I thought maybe we could talk about what it's like to be brothers, and what it's like to really be uh, brothers uh, with the last name of Chopra, and uh, see where that goes. <laughs> so, uh, I, I was curious, I mean, you, you could have done a lot of different things with your time. Uh, what, 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 what inspired you to, to write the book, to collaborate together, to share your stories? What, what triggered it? So I, I'll start first. Uh, when you ask the question, what is it to be brothers, I can uh, not go anywhere in the world and show my passport or if I'm wearing a badge that the person looking at it doesn't ask the question, are you related to Deepak? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very proud of it. And I say, yes, he's my brother. And then about half the time they say, no, you're just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a very nice experience once when I was uh, in, in, um, in this country and I was running the American Gastroenterology Postgraduate Annual Course. So I'm wearing a suit, I'm wearing my name badge, and I go to a Starbucks and I'm getting a coffee and the lady behind the counter says, Chopra, Dr. Chopra. You're not related to Deepak? I said, yeah, he's my brother. And she said, oh, I love him. My mother loves him. We read all his books. The cafe latte is on me. <laughs> so I, I came out, I called Deepak. He was in Sydney, Australia. I said, what are you doing? Where are you? He said, I just finished the talk. I said, Deepak, it took you 52 years, but you finally came through. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Got a free coffee. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so Deepak. Um, do, do, anyone, do you ever get asked uh, who, if he's your brother? <laughs> Actually, even if I don't get asked, I say, do you know my brother is the Dean for Continuing Medical Education at Harvard Medical School? He's a world-famous hepatologist and gastroenterologist, a professor of medicine at Harvard, and because of him, I get to speak over there once a year. Wow, wow. <laughs> I, um, backstage we were talking about the benefits of coffee. Right. Total aside, but I don't know how many people here drink coffee, but I'm sort of addicted myself. Uh, given that it's one of your specialties, the, the, uh, you, you 
understand the benefits because of uh, what it's one of your specialties. Could you share with us the benefits of coffee? <laughs> right. Uh, so how many people here drink coffee? How many of you drink regular coffee? How many of you drink more than two cups a day? How many of you drink more than six cups a day? Come on, you're out there. It's good for you. And the first study came out about 20 years ago and a simple observation that people who drink coffee have low levels of liver enzymes in the blood. And that's one way we monitor if somebody has liver disease or not. And then studies came out that they have less fibrosis or scarring of the liver, less proclivity to cirrhosis of the liver, less chance of liver cancer. Cancer arising in the liver is the third leading cause of cancer mortality in the world. And drinking two cups of regular coffee decreases it by 40%. It also turns out that it lowers the risk of metastatic prostate cancer, endometrial cancer, melanoma, and colon cancers. Type 2 diabetes, Parkinsonism, gout, cognitive decline, which is dementia. And then the most recent study in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the most prestigious medical journal, that coffee drinkers have lower total and all-cause mortality. And they're mechanistic explanations, and none of these studies have been sponsored by Starbucks. <laughs> wow. So now everyone who is going to buy a book should go buy coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so Deepak, um, in, in the book you, you talk about you know, brotherhood, and, and, and you certainly talk about your father, who was a very prominent uh, a doctor in India. I was just curious, uh, for those of you who haven't, for the crowd who hasn't read the book yet, if you could talk about a little bit how, uh, what, what, what inspired you to go spiritual, because uh, your brother is certainly well, well, very well respected, uh, world famous doctor at Harvard. Um, what, what triggered that, that, what was inside of you that, that tr brought you out to, to, to follow a spiritual path and of enlightenment? It's complicated, as usual. There's no one cause for anything. Our father was an example of great spirituality, if by that you mean love, compassion, empathy, joy, equanimity, truth, goodness, beauty. He had it all. So he was an expression of that. My training was in endocrinology <clears throat> and later on in neuroendocrinology and this was in the 70s and at that time we were discovering what now everybody knows are the molecules of emotion. So you've all heard of things like serotonin, opiates, oxytocin, dopamine. Uh, in the 70s we had a new technique called radioimmunoassay. One of my colleagues was a, a person called Candice Pert, who later became the chief of brain chemistry at the NIH. So she actually wrote a book called The Molecules of Emotion. I wrote the introduction to it at that time. Uh, it was a huge uh, national bestseller. It's still around. And uh, she gave me the inkling first, actually, that there was a biological basis for how the mind or consciousness affects not only neurotransmitters, but biological responses everywhere in the body. I subsequently uh, embarked on my own experiments with meditation, starting with TM. And uh, I realized, at some point I realized that if you give somebody bad news, right, um, the response is immediate. If I say to someone, uh, you have cancer, or you lost all your money, or whatever, their blood pressure goes up immediately, their cortisol goes up immediately, adrenaline, platelets get sticky right away. So the opposite must be true also. The response should be immediate and it should be at a cellular level. So that was the beginning and then later I realized that that wasn't enough, you know. Where does thought come from and who are we, the deeper questions. In a sense, it was just an extension from physical to emotional to mental to spiritual. And, and the path you followed was were you being driven from inside of you. You just felt this need to go and to follow and to make stuff happen. Well, I was lucky to meet one of the greatest teachers of uh, you know meditation, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. He introduced me to a lot of people. I went to conferences, and you know I tried to correlate what I was experiencing with what I knew 
but in it, terms of... Uh, but at these conferences, did people embrace you at the time? Did they say this is amazing? The ones I went to, yes. Ah, you but know, what was happening was, around the world in other places? I think in the beginning there was a lot of resistance. There were even uh, articles written in the new in, uh, in the American Medical Association of Medicine. Uh, a lot of people called me a quack, etc. And uh, it was tough. On the other hand, I felt convinced that intuitively I felt that this was the right thing to do. At a certain point, you give up. Um, being uh, influenced by criticism because it, it can be quite hurtful, so you say. Um, and, and these Even days, now, by the way, if you go on the internet, you'll see a lot of people saying, what's he smoking? <laughs> but at the same time, each year you now host an event which brings together the world scientists. Say that again? Now you bring together an event that... that yeah, we have an event. Sanjeev is speaking at the event. You're speaking at the event. It's called Sages and Scientists, and we bring together cosmologists, evolutionary biologists, philosophers. We have an annual award that we give to the biggest contributions to science and consciousness. So last year we gave it to uh, the scientists who described dark matter and to Rudy Tanzi with whom I collaborated on Superbrain for showing that our genes are not deterministic, that you're not your genes, just like you're not your brain. So yeah, we've come a long way. I, um, I, I just applaud you for, for perseverance and for following your, yourself and for, for, for being, because uh, you certainly influence millions of people's lives uh, and continue to do so. Um, Jeff, can I chime in here? Please. I, I think Deepak is being very modest uh, about this. And when he first embarked on this journey, a um, lot of people thought he was a quack and what is he doing? And even members of his own family were somewhat concerned. He, had a thriving practice in Massachusetts in endocrinology. Uh, he, he's really a brilliant guy, was a debater, a journalist, had uh, All India Radio News, uh, medical students from New England Medical Center, okay, Tufts would okay, rotate okay. through his office. Oh. And uh, <laughs> it's all right, I can brag about you. <laughs> uh, you know, one of my f favorite quotes is from Soren Kierkegaard, the great Danish philosopher and theologian, and he once said, to dare is to lose one's footing momentarily. Not to dare is to lose oneself. Wow. I think Deepak found himself and embarked on this journey, and it was a very courageous step. And how are you, since you mentioned family members were reacting, what was your position on this? My uh, position was, I don't know what he's getting into. Uh, he came home, his, he and his wife, uh, Rita, had learned meditation and talked to my wife, Amita, and me. And my wife is very spiritual, and she wanted to learn meditation right away the next week. And I said to the three of them, good for you. <laughs> and, and, and when did you uh, It took me a month, ah. not that long. And then I, I went uh, to the TM Center, and I was still hesitant to go into the center. I'm sitting in the car reading something, and out comes Deepak's instructor. And he says, hi, I'm so-and-so, Eric. And do you have any questions about TM? And he gave me the introductory lecture in the car. And uh, I said, yes, I have three questions. Number one, I'm the associate chief of medicine at the hospital, and we have these brilliant Harvard medical students and house staff, and I need to every now and then reprimand them, and I don't want to become mellow. And number two, I like to drink single malt scotch, and I don't want to give it up. And number three, I'm in a tennis tournament. I'm in the finals. Will I win? And he says, I'll be back. And he goes into the TM Center, comes back running with a pamphlet. It's called the TM Program in Athletics, Excellence in Action. And uh, testimonials by Willie Stargell and Joe Namath. And so I looked at it. I said, wait, wait, I'm in the finals. Will I win? And he said, I don't know if you'll win, but if you lose, you won't feel that bad. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you do? So I learned meditation. Ah. And now I actually tell all my colleagues, my friends, my students, and I have a saying, you should meditate once a day. And if you don't have time to do that, you should meditate twice a day. <laughs> wow. Wow. So um, early in the book, uh, there's a mention about your uncle. and about right. re There was a passage about re reincarnation and about being close to your, to, in your family. And um, I was wondering if did maybe, uh, you, it was your chapter. Yeah. It's, a, it's an amazing story, Jeff. Um, 
of course, we weren't there to witness it, but uh, our mother was born and she had a four-year-old brother. And uh, our grandparents named our mother Suchinta. And this four-year-old goes to his parents, so our grandparents, and says, what kind of a name is that? Uh, it has a very negative connotation. So they said, what are you talking about? Four? He's four years of age. <laughs> and he said, well, it incorporates the word Chinta, Suchinta. And Chinta means worry. And that's not a good name for this beautiful baby sister of mine. So to humor him, our grandfather says, okay, what would you like to name him? And he said, Pushpa, which means a flower. And then at age four, five, he could recite passages from the Gita, whole passages. He was very spiritual. He'd be eating lunch, and he'd suddenly get up and sense that there was a monk at the front gate with a begging bowl. And he would invite him and say to the servant, Dalit, give him my lunch. So all this was happening, and he was four or five years of age. And one day he goes to his older sister, who was more like a mother to him, quite a difference in the age is about 18 years. And he said, Bare Bhanji, I need 16 rupees, which is $2. And she said, what do you need it for? And he said, Dalat, the servant, I owe him from a past life. And he pestered her till she finally gave up and gave the servant 16 rupees. And the servant wouldn't take it. And she said, no, 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 you got to take it. After that was over, he, she used to make his bed every night, tuck him into bed, sing him a lullaby. And one night as she was doing that, he said, no, don't make my bed. Uh, make, put the mattress on the floor and my pillow and blanket there. And in India, that means you're going to die. You want to be on earth. And she said, nonsense, what are you saying? And she put him on his regular bed, sang him a lullaby, tucked him in. And in the morning when they woke up, he was on the floor and he had passed away. So he also admonished our grandfather who had a BB gun and he was shooting a pigeon and we can visualize that home very well, 17 Barber Road in Delhi. And he said, why did you shoot that innocent bird? What grief did it give you? You shouldn't have done that. This is a four year old. So he admonished his father, he changed our mother's name, he recited passages from the Gita, he would go out to the monks and welcome them. He repaid a debt to Dalit, and he predicted his death. And prior to that, I, I didn't sort of believe in reincarnation. Uh, but it happened in our family. When our mother died, Deepak and I did the cremation. We took the ashes to Haridwar, to the holy Ganges. And these pundits or priests come running, and they want to know the name. And they said, what's, what's your mother's name? You're here for her cremation? We said, yeah. And we said, uh, Pushpa. So maiden name, Pushpa Anand, uh, married name, Pushpa Chopra, and they couldn't find it. And so Deepak picked up his cell phone and called our aunt in Delhi and said, we had heard this story, but remind us what was her name uh, when she was born, the given name. And uh, she said, Suchinta. So we said, Suchinta Anand, and then the priest had the entire lineage oh, going wow. back generations. Wow. So for those of you, you know, I, this is a selective audience, so you kind of respond very positively to the story, but there's, I also know that we're being live streamed and there are a lot of people on the internet and they're going to be saying, woo, mm. okay, <laughs> very good, there they go again, woo, woo. I, I'm okay, sorry. So but the bigger question that is being asked right now in neuroscience is about what is consciousness? Where is it? Is it a product of the brain? And if you ask neuroscientists, the best neuroscientists in the world, and I collaborate with them so I know, where in the brain is memory stored at the cellular level? What's the you know, chemical trace of memory? And the answer is we don't know. So if I asked you a simple question, what did you have for lunch uh, last, this morning? What did you have for lunch? I don't, last month, I have no idea. No, no, this morning. Uh, this, this afternoon. Oh, this afternoon I had some vegetables. Okay, so now of course you have the experience, you're right. remembering it. There's no place in the brain where that's stored, you know, or do you remember the house you lived in when you were a teenager? I do. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, there's no place in the brain. So where was that memory before the question was asked? And there's a number of people who are suggesting that it actually wasn't in his brain, it existed in a possibility field. 
that's non-local, outside of space-time. And when I asked him the question, his intention collapsed the wave, and suddenly there was a neural kind of uh, action. That's where science is going. So what, what recycles? Is a person recycling? Are memories recycling? Is it the Akashic field? It's the zero-point energy field? These are very relevant questions in science. So this story is actually seems anecdotal. Many scientists might scoff at it. But there are 2,500 cases of such stories 2, documented. cases. University of Virginia by Ian Stevenson. Go look him up on the internet, Ian Stevenson. And you'll find that they occur all over the world. Now you say, why don't we all have these memories? Uh, well, at some level we do, but probably they're not important. If I asked you, like I asked him, what did you have for dinner three weeks ago? You probably don't remember because it wasn't, more, it wasn't important. Anyway, that's a digression, but. No, uh, but I think it's kind it's of. It's kind of it, fascinating it sort of brings, because. It bridges you yeah. know, what, what you're working on, what you're doing, what you're thinking. Um, you know, ba based on your experiences as doctors um, and, and you know, where your training took you and where you've gone, um, you know, if you bo both of you have kids? Yeah. Um, do you ever suggest to your kids what they should do, or do you give them the chance to follow, find their own path? I have uh, three kids, and my wife is a pediatrician, <clears throat> and she and I were on call when they were very young, very often, every third weekend, every third day, and we would have to yank them off uh, birthday parties because the beeper was going off. And all three of them said to, to my wife and I that uh, we don't want to be doctors. You work too hard. And I said, no matter what profession you go into, in order to succeed, you'll have to work very hard. But our middle daughter, who's sitting here somewhere, yeah. uh, hi, Kanika, hmm. uh, is married. And uh, we have t two wonderful granddaughters, six and eight years of age. They live in Manhattan. The eight-year-old, Anya, when she was five years of age, my wife, Amita, smuggled her into the Jacob Javits Center I was the course director of a Harvard Medical School and Columbia Presbyterian annual course, 5,000 doctors, and you're not allowed to bring kids. And I'm giving a talk, and I make it a point to scan the audience on the left, middle, and right, and suddenly I see my wife and Anya, five years of age, sitting there. And she's copying every single gesture. <laughs> At the end of the talk, the usual applause, people ask questions, I come down, and uh, she's holding my hand, and then we're going to the faculty lounge for lunch, and she turns to me and says, Nana, which means maternal grandfather, when I grow up, I want to be a doctor like you. Mm -hmm. uh, and now uh, she's eight, and the younger sister, Mira, so I asked them recently, they were in Boston, I said, Anya, you remember that time you came? And she vaguely remembered it. I said, do you still want to be a doctor? And she said, yes, but I want to be a children's doctor like Nani. And then ah. the six-year-old chimes in, me too. I want to be a children's doctor like Anya, <laughs> as though her ah. elder sister is already wow. a pediatrician. And, and, and your kids, Deepak? Well, they're not, um, they're not in the medical profession. My son, Gautam, uh, is the producer of comic books in India. And independent and, film. And film and uh, documentaries. He's just produced uh, a series on cricket for ESPN. And, and he's doing and actually and producing well. an Oprah Winfrey yeah. series that's coming out. And we want to, oh, that's since, right. we're, since we're on the topic, you know the date? Uh, I think it's June 1st. June 1st, uh, I think it's in the morning. Yes. Uh, 11 to 2. We're doing a Q&A at uh, Madison Square Park. There's somebody who is representing uh, Mike uh, Reinhardt here. Yeah. Mark Reinhardt. Anyone? Right. She you is. are. So can you tell them about this filming so people can show up? We haven't done the schedule yet, but it is June 1st. Probably it will be two two-hour sessions. Um, outside with so this is a production for Oprah Winfrey. And if you just go on my Twitter feed, Deepak Chopra, or uh, you'll find out. We want you to come because we want a big crowd. OK. Thank you. Okay, no so worries. anyway, he, but, he's but a Deepak film mentioned Gotham, his uh, son, my nephew, who's making comics. What about Gotham's wife, Candace? 
She is an ophthalmologist an and ophthalmic oh, surgeon. Uh, yeah. I, cannot... yeah. I had to jog uh, his memory. Yeah. And my daughter has a social networking site called intent.com. She's co-hosting the Twitter conference uh, 140 with Jeff uh, in the next, when is that? June 18th and 19th. So there you are. <laughs> wow. But I, I, uh, in, in the movie that uh, your son made of about you, there was a scene in India which brought you, went, that uh, looked like was uh, when you went back and, and you looked at your family. That's what Sanjeev was talking right. about. Right. Could you talk a little you bit? You have these family records, and it's very interesting because in a few minutes they have identified uh, who your ancestors were. And when you see, you know, the entries there, they're first in English because that's when the British were there. Then they turned to Hindi and Urdu. Urdu is a mixture of Persian and Hindi. Then they go into Farsi and they keep going back. And so once upon a time, in a previous visit, I asked, how far can you go back? And they said, how far do you want us to go back? <laughs> I said, since how long are you doing this? It said since the time of Alexander the Great, 323 BC, when they came from, from Greece. Um, Greece, Macedonia, to this part of the world, we've been keeping records. So I was just cal doing some mathematics in my head, and I realized that that's, you know, if you go back that many generations, you go back to tens of millions of people who lived, loved, died, and if one of them was not in the mood, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> so the statistical likelihood, the statistical likelihood of our existence is almost zero. Wow. And since we still are here, yeah. it should be a perpetual surprise that we exist. So I, I have to ask, uh, what have you learned from each other, um, you, as kids, as adults? What, what, you know, where do you continue to learn? What I've learned uh, from Deepak is that. Um, you shouldn't have any boundaries. Uh, that capacity is a state of mind. Uh, Deepak can be working on three books simultaneously and writing lyrics for Michael Jackson, which he did, and starting a World Peace Conference in, Cost in, in uh, Puerto Rico and writing Oscar Arias, Nobel Laureate from Costa Rica, and on and on and on. And so I started to think about that, and I said to myself, I can also do that. And so I'm often involved in multiple projects. I've not been as prolific as him. I still see patients and do clinical research and teach all over the world. But I've uh, written six or seven, seven books now. This is our first collaboration. And I'm in the process of writing another two. And I don't think I would necessarily have thought that way unless I'd witnessed uh, his prolific writing. Mm. Well, what I've learned from him is the value of discipline. Sanjeev has, is very precise in what he does. Um, he knows what he wants to achieve, and he does it. And when he came to this country, um, when we were growing up anyway, he was the athlete, and I was the studious one. And I used to actually fret and worry about him and his academic uh, performances. So, you know, really? when he went on to become who he is today, in the beginning, I was very surprised. <laughs> 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 uh, but now I realize that, you know. Uh, That's another quality I, I admire in him, candor. Yeah. So uh, what was surprising was, you know, when we did our chapters independently, so I didn't look at his chapters, he didn't look at mine. And I had this feeling that he must think I'm a flake. And I was surprised to think, <laughs> to realize that actually he didn't. So that was. You know, Nice. But, you know, Big relief. <laughs> what's it, when you were reading the chapters of each other's writing, what surprised you the most when you were reading through it? Very little. I mean, we had similar memories and almost identical experiences, and the ones that stood out were also very similar. Yeah, that's true. It was uncanny. And, um, I mean, would you do this again? Would you collaborate again on a book or a yeah, project? It has to be something. You know, when he called me, he said, let's do this book. My first reaction is, why would anyone want to read this book, you know? <laughs> I mean, usually his books are about very special topics. Mine are about ideas. This was about us. And so in the beginning, I was a bit squeamish about the idea. But then I also realized it would give us an opportunity to reflect on our lives 
and uh, how we came to where we are. It would give us an opportunity to be together and, you know, re-enliven our bond, which was always there. And as we've done in the last two days, we've done media, I've been surprised actually, very pleasantly, that people are much more interested in this book than they've been in any of the books I've written. <laughs> <laughs> but, you well, know, Deepak and I, in these six days that we are spending in New York, Washington, Los Angeles, we'll probably spend more time together than we would have in the last 20 years. And how does that feel? And, and that in itself it is so worth it for doing the book. Uh, wow, it's, it's a real blessing. It's, it's wonderful. So um, I just want to go back to that place in India where, where your families were. Because I remember in the book you wrote about you left a message for your, fa for your kids. I did because, you know, I saw messages from our parents to us and their parents to them and their parents to them. So yes, I did leave a message to my kids one day. They will come there when uh, they probably bring my ashes. Although in the film I told Gotham you can throw them in the backyard. I remember that. The Hudson <laughs> River. It doesn't really make a difference. We can break tradition. Um, but just in case they come there, I said, um, just remember that, you know, long time ago somebody was thinking of you and um, still loves you. Wow. Thank you for writing that. I mean, yeah. thank you for sharing that. So, um, you know, when you look at how um, your lives have been similar but different, is there anything that you wish you had done so far that you haven't done yet? Is there any, like you, you, you've, you certainly have embraced both sides, I think, of medicine, and you certainly have been incredibly successful. And, but are, are there certain passions that you put aside to, to achieve what you've done that you wish you actually had more time for? I think maybe uh, spend uh, more time with Deepak and our families and now our grandkids. Um, when Deepak had his first grandchild, uh, I called him and congratulated him and I said, how does it feel? And he said, uh, there's only one word, intoxicating. <laughs> he would actually watch his granddaughter while she was asleep just breathe in and out. And I couldn't relate to that till I had my first grandchild, granddaughter. And it's really, for those of you who are grandparents, you'll be able to relate it. Um, it's an amazing experience. There's nothing that uh, comes close. Uh, there's a saying, you love your children with your heart, you love your grandchildren with your heart and soul. Oh. And, and that's the way it feels. And Tagore was a Nobel laureate from India. Uh, he had written in 1912 a series of small poems called Gitanjali in his native language, Bengali. Very spiritual poetry. And the next year, he translated it himself into English and he got the Nobel Prize in Literature that very year. And Tagore once said, every child comes with the message that God is not yet discouraged of man. Every child comes with the message, God is not yet discouraged of man. So um, when I see the children, uh, my own grandchildren, his grandchildren, uh, it's the most fulfilling and rewarding thing. And they're going to be there in Boston on Memorial Day weekend when we are back from the tour and I'm going to see his granddaughters, and our grandkids will be there. They'll all be playing together. Wow. See, when we had our children, we were really busy, doctors. So we give, have to give credit to our wives to have given them the attention that they got, which was amazing. But when you have your grandchildren, as we did, uh, you've kind of gone over the phase of driving ambition, hard work, exacting plans, mm -hmm. you have the opportunity to see, really, I would say evolution as you've never seen before. Um, I was sharing a story with Sanjeev this morning that we have a ritual that every Christmas the babies come, as I call them, and we take them to Broadway. I take them to Broadway by myself. So when Tara, the eldest, was three years old, I took her to Lion She's King. She's nine now. She's 10, 10. 11. 11. 11. Um, <laughs> so she was three years old. I took her to Lion King. And when Zimba died, Zimba the lion died, she was heartbroken, and we had to leave the theater. Uh, oh. So then again, I took her um, at the age of four again. And Zimba died, and we had to leave the theater. But <laughs> as soon as we left the theater, she wanted to go back to see how it would end, the play. So there was some 
evolution. Right. Third year, she's now uh, five years, and Zimba dies, and she turns to me and she says, Nana, don't worry, it's just the cycle of life. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. So there you see this evolution. <laughs> My grandson, who's now uh, five, the other day I landed in, um, in Los Angeles, and he comes to pick me up with uh, Gotham. He says, uh, Dada, what is dark energy? <laughs> I said, um, I said uh, what do you know about dark energy? He says, it flows through the night sky. I said, that's pretty good. What else do you know about it? He said, it's 70% of the universe. <laughs> I said, wow. So, you know, then we're driving out of the airport, and we are going past Santa Monica and looking at the ocean. He says, how did they make the ocean? I said, how did who make the ocean? He said, they. I said, no, you have to tell me. What do you mean by they? So he thinks for a minute, then he reframes the question. He says, how did the ocean get made? <laughs> I said, well, it got made the way the Earth got made. It's a piece of rock that fell off a star, and there are lots of rocks there. We call them the solar system. I said, um, uh, do you know how many planets there are in the solar system? He said, well, if you count Pluto, there are nine. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I said, and do you know where the solar system came from? He said, from uh, the galaxy? I said, yeah. Where did the galaxy come from? He said, from the stars? I said, that's true. I said, where did they come from? He said, from the universe? I said, where did the universe come from? He said, from another dimension. <laughs> so that's 30 years of my work. <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, I'm saying, you know, being Indian, we've been talking about reincarnation. I'm thinking Einstein, uh, <laughs> you know, Galileo. So I said, how do you know all this? He says, it's on Pokemon. <laughs> 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 Wow. So if you're not playing wow. those video games, you're not in touch with the collective conversation. But the point I want to make, <laughs> the point I want to make is that this is a whole evolution of consciousness. Sure. You know, generation after generation after generation. It's very mysterious to follow this. But and it seems that we're at the very beginning of something great, and, and it seems that we're on the cusp of going there. It seems um, like that. Yeah. Um, so, so the, the next few years ahead. Uh, no, it's it. We there's right there's there's uh, magic that people will continue to discover. Uh, you know, Deepak, what what are you looking forward to next? In the next you know three four years ahead for you. Well, on on the level of. Um, social networks, which I'm totally fascinated by and invite you all to be part of Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, all these networks. I think my personal goal right now is to reach 100 million people uh, with the idea of personal and social transformation in the direction of a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and happier world. And I'm obsessed with that vision. Um, on the, on the scientific, philosophical level, and that you'll see when you come to Sages and both of them are going to be speaking, I think the major question right now in science is, what's the stuff of the universe? What is it made up of? And the answer is, in science, there's no answer, except that, as my grandson said, most of it is dark energy and dark matter, which is not atomic. We don't know what it is. The 5% that is atomic ultimately also turns out to be nothing because subatomic particles are basically impulses of information and energy that are coming in and out of a void. We don't know what the nature of this void is. And the second big question in science is what's the nature of consciousness? We don't know the answers. And yet there are great scientists who are beginning to suggest that the universe is a conscious living entity and that the universe is alive, and that we are expressions of that consciousness. In India, we learned Atman is Brahman. That is the self of the individual, is the self of the universe. That knowledge, combined with the, all the transformation that's happening in the world, has the ability to radically change how we live our lives. Because right now, with climate change, war, terrorism, eco-destruction, we're risking our extinction, and only a new kind of paradigm will change that. So that's where I am right now. It's the autumn of my life. 
that's what I want to do. And so, <coughs> it's great, people. So I've actually reflected on this uh, only very recently. Uh, I've always had goals and action plans, but about a month ago, I decided to write my purpose. Uh, what is my purpose? And I've, I wrote it down, and I've shown it to just a few people, my wife and my kids, and also to Deepak. And so I, I, I wrote, uh, my purpose is to follow my dharma, to teach medicine, well-being, and leadership, to do it anchored and grounded in humility, to be constantly learning, to be the best friend for my family and my large circle of friends who are my chosen family, to continue to be inspired by them and to strive to inspire them uh, in any small way, if possible. So that, wow. to me, is, is my wow. purpose now. Wow. You, you both also lower my golf handicap. Ah. <laughs> you, you both referenced dharma. Dharm. Could you explain for people who are not familiar with what that is? A little yeah, so dharma, to me, is the distillation of moral, ethics, duty, doing the right thing. And in the book, we relate a story about dharma, and it's a true story. So everyone in India has been inoculated against smallpox. There's one villager in the foothills of the Himalayas in a village by the name of Lakshman Singh, and he says, you cannot inoculate me, my wife, and my kids. I believe God ordains who will be diseased and who will be healthy. So the Indian government, the Ministry of Health, the World Health Organization are stymied. They say, what are we going to do? And they finally decide there's only one way to inoculate this guy and his family, and that's forcibly. So they take the police, they invade his hut, it's now six in the morning, and he resists, he fights, they pin him down to the ground, they rip off his shirt, they jab needles into him, his wife is screaming, she gets inoculated, the kids are inoculated. By now the entire village is awake, and he turns to the group and he says, please sit down. He turns to his wife and he says, make tea for them. And he himself goes back to the little vegetable plot behind his hut, plucks the juiciest, ripest cucumbers, radishes, cleans them, and serves it to them. And they're going, wait a minute, what are you doing? You're treating us like royalty, and we invaded your hut, and we forcibly inoculated you. And he answers, and here's this uneducated person in a village in India, and he says, I believed God ordains who will be diseased and who will be healthy. I upheld my dharma. You obviously believed it was your dharma to forcibly inoculate me. It is now over, and you are guests in my home, and this is the least I can serve you. So we all have a dharma to our family, to our friends, to our society, to the synagogue, the church, the temple. <clears throat> and to me, this story also illustrates that it can change very quickly. Sure. So uh, when I first heard this story, I, I thought it was really beautiful and it captures the meaning of the word dharma. So um, before we go to questions uh, to the audience, I was just curious as brothers, because I, I only have sisters and I never had brothers, what did you guys fight about as kids? I mean, like, what, what was it that, like, like, you know, did you fight about? Did you fight? Well, they listened to me. I used to issue the orders <laughs> and he would follow them. There was nothing to fight about. Did that surprise you? No, it was the way our mother kind of trained us. I was, I was Ram and he was Lakshman. This is a great <laughs> mythical story. So he just had to listen to what I said. And did you fight though? Did you fight? No, though? I listened to him. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, I mean, you can. It, it's it will take a little too long to tell this story, but if you happen to read the book, you'll read it. Uh, Deepak has this Kirk Douglas chin. With a BB. Uh, I'm responsible for it. <laughs> I was doing target shooting and he came and stood next to me and he said, go ahead. And I said, what are you doing? He says, William Tell, Apple, you never miss. So I was nervous and I shot and I missed and it hit him in the chin. And he said, now we're going to go home and tell mom and grandmother that I tripped and a piece of barbed wire nicked me. And I said, Deepak, that's a lie. 
he said, and I was nine, he was 11. He said, I'm Ram and you're Lakshman. You're gonna listen to me. So we went home, we told a lie. Over the next couple of days, he had a swelling here. Our grandmother was staying with us and she said to our father, I think you should take him and get an X-ray. There may be a piece of barbed wire stuck in there. And uh, it was a summer vacation. I'm pacing the veranda every few minutes. I go inside, mom, did they call from the hospital? She said, you're very worried. And the phone <laughs> rang and my father said, there's a bullet lodged in there. <laughs> Now, he was, he was a good marksman because if he had shot me here, <laughs> we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. But you learned something from that experience um, about speaking the truth, right? Yeah. Yeah. After yeah. that, we never lied. Yeah, we <laughs> wow. Um, no, I, 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 but I, I thought it was a very telling part of this in the beginning of the book. It just, just sort of set the stage for, for a lot of your relationship. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I won't, I won't, uh, we'll, we'll let them read about the car chase, you know, we'll, uh, <laughs> um, but I have some questions I will pick uh, here. What advice do you have for people just beginning to, uh, beginning their path of meditation? Well, you know, there are lots of kinds of meditations, and since you asked the question, I'm not going to miss this opportunity. Um, <laughs> how many people took the 21-day meditation challenge? Please raise your hands, please. Okay, so I'd say about 10% in this room, 15% in the last uh, three months I've been traveling the world and I asked the same question uh, in Moscow, in South Korea, in Brazil, in Argentina. We have a program going on right now called the 21 Day Challenge Meditation with Oprah Winfrey as our partner. And the last one, 700,000 people did this program. It's the largest meditation experiment in the history of civilization, 700,000. So our next one is in about in two months, and we should have a million people doing meditation together. And you can go to chopracentermeditation.com, it's free, and uh, join this experiment, because talk about critical mass, we may be there very soon. Having said that, if you take five minutes every day and watch your breath and even ask yourself, who am I, what do I want, what's my purpose, how do I want to serve, and then let go, that's a great start. But come and join us for the 21 Day Challenge too. Jeff, I'm going to chime in and also answer that person's question. And I would say if you're just starting meditation, you should meditate once a day. And if you don't have time to do that, you should meditate twice a day. <laughs> Great. Um, so it's topical here with the uh, coffee. Does decaf, decaf coffee have the same effects? Uh, so not for liver disease, but for type 2 diabetes, Parkinsonism, gout, the other cancers, uh, decaf uh, is as good. We don't know what is the mechanism. Coffee has thousands of constituents, caviol, cafestol. It's very rich in antioxidants, uh, chlorogenic acid. It's insulin sensitizing. So, lots of mechanisms. By the way, I've become a coffee expert in the last two days. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, how do you deal with drug addiction with, with teenagers in a society where it's glamorized in the media? I have my own take on drug addiction, and that is it's, uh, it's the memory of pleasure, and then what you get hooked to is the memory, even when it's not pleasurable anymore, so you can't get enough of what you don't want anymore. And that's why addiction is so difficult to treat. We have a center outside of Vancouver where we create addiction to spirit. So we say from spirits to spirit. And uh, uh, addiction to well-being and health. And uh, it's a very unique program that is based on a deeper understanding, which is you can't get rid of memory. Memories, if it's in the Akashic field, it's there forever. So you cannot get rid of the memory of addiction. What you can do is create a new memory that's more powerful than the old one. Wow. Um, I'm just reading these through. Um, okay, this came up through the audience. How do you stay happy in a marriage when you give up your dreams so your spouse can fulfill their dreams? Wow. That, uh... <laughs> 
Uh, Amita, asking. did you ask that question? <laughs> That's my wife. <laughs> she, she was the most brilliant student at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences and she basically made the sacrifice of uh, doing clinical pediatrics while I pursued my dream and she raised three beautiful children and now she's totally attached to her beautiful grandchildren. She's also a teacher of meditation. So I think um, the, the broader question could be um, how do you stay happy? And um, there's some research on that, and, and the research shows that the happiest people on this planet have two or three things in common. The first one is they all have lots of good friends, right? Your friends are your chosen family. I'm lucky this guy is my brother, but you know, I didn't get that choice. So your friends are your chosen family. The second attribute of the happiest people is the ability to forgive. Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison, he's released, he's asked the question, do you harbor resentment or bitterness against your captors? He said, I have no resentment. I have no bitterness. Resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. So friends, forgiveness. And then the third one <clears throat> is Albert Schweitzer, who was a physician, theologian, musician, humanitarian, very humble man. In 1952, he got the Nobel Peace Prize. And when he got it, he said, now I have to go earn it. And he once said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I'm certain of, the ones amongst you who will be truly happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. So I've distilled it into three Fs, friends, forgiveness, and for others. Success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key, key to, to success. Happiness. Albert Schweitzer also said that. Wow, Deepak? That was, wow. Wow. Um, uh, there's a bunch of Deepak specific questions. I'll just pick one here. Uh, what inspires you on a daily basis? You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, What's the prayer you say every Yeah, day? no, but okay. my inspiration I don't need because I'm a compulsive, <laughs> obsessive neurotic. And <laughs> I'm obsessed with understanding consciousness and so I don't stop thinking about it and then what inspires me is the, the fact that our social networks today have become like the global brain you know with the social networks we're actually creating a new brain that will take us out of our narrow nationalism ethnocentrism bigotry hatred prejudice and so my inspiration is the ability to reach people globally and to participate with them in solving problems. So again, at the Sages and Scientists Conference, uh, we'll have people who actually have been able to harness collective creativity globally. There's no problem actually, whether it's global warming, climate change, um, uh, the poverty in the world that doesn't at the moment have a creative solution. and. The only thing we need to do right now is to harness that creativity collectively. That inspires me. Wow, thank you, thank you. Um, so many young people are cynical and lacking spirituality. How can, you turn, how can they be turned on? I think, first of all, redefine spirituality, okay? Don't confuse it with uh, dogma, ideology, even self-righteous morality. One simplest way to understand spirituality is self-awareness, period. Nobody would be threatened by the two words, self-awareness. Krishnamurti said, the highest form of human intelligence is the ability to observe yourself without judging yourself. So you just start with that. Nobody's going to object. Nobody's going to be cynical. Who wouldn't want to be self-aware so they could harness their intuition, their insight, their creativity, their imagination, their well-being. So I think we need to redefine how we term this word, spirituality. Thank you. Um, see, how, what, would, what would you suggest for someone who has this fibromyalgia? Um, fibromyalgia. Yeah. Uh, you're asking the wrong person. My specialty is liver disease. <laughs> so uh, I don't know about fibromyalgia that much, and I don't want to give you wrong advice, but talk to a good rheumatologist, 
Uh, don't look up the internet. There's a lot of uh, nonsense on the internet. It's very difficult to sort out what's going on, what's true, and what's not true. Um, would you please comment on the recent passing of inspirational uh, Stuart Wilde? Stuart Wilde. Stuart was a great friend of mine. In fact, uh, he's the one who introduced me to, um, to Wayne Dyer, to my friend Leon Maxson, to the publishers of Hay House. Uh, I don't know how many people knew Stuart, but he played with the dark side of spirituality as well. And uh, he was uh, also very driven as a human being. He lived a good life. He changed many people's lives too. And he recently passed away in um, Ireland while driving a car. And um, it was a time for all of us to not only grieve, but also to celebrate his life and all that we had learned, and he brought a lot of us together. So thank you for asking. Um, and this reminds me of just what happened in Oklahoma, but uh, someone asked, can we take a moment to send healing love, uh, love energy to the earth and all living beings? That's great. I like to think we could sure. take a moment and do that. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Question for me, I'll pass on that. Um, Deepak, if you had an enlightened individual at your disposal for half an hour, what, if any questions, would you ask them? You don't need Deepak, to. Deepak, go ahead. You don't need <laughs> to. <laughs> me. Uh, if you're in the presence of an enlightened person, you don't need to ask them anything. Their presence is enough. Their being is enough. That was our experience with Maharishi. How would you define enlightenment? Well, enlightenment is a progressive expansion of awareness into unity consciousness. So, you know, we have waking, dreaming, sleeping, soul consciousness, cosmic consciousness, divine consciousness, unity consciousness. Go to YouTube. There's a new video on, on enlightenment today. YouTube.com slash the Chopra Well. It says the path to enlightenment. And it's very well done. It's animated. My son has produced it. So look at it. Um, how would you advise or convince someone to give alternative health a try? I wouldn't. I would say get the, you know, this is, these terms are misleading, alternative, integrative, uh, complementary. Why not just call it medicine? What works, works. And, you know, different things work in different situations. If you have pneumonia, you need an antibiotic. If you break your leg, you need to see an orthopedic surgeon. Having said that, there are lots of chronic illnesses, lots of chronic illnesses, where um, holistic methods will help you decrease inflammation in the body, restore homeostasis, which is self-repair mechanisms. So each disease has to be treated uh, on its own basis as each individual, you know, the era of personalized medicine is here upon us. And I hope we'll get rid of these words, alternative, com complementary. It's medicine is medicine and healing is healing. How can one find his innermost voice? I mean, any suggestions how someone can discover, you know, because some, sometimes you have many voices. I think you have to, you have to follow your passion. And, and uh, follow your passion and then you'll find your inner voice. Uh, Joseph Campbell once said, follow your bliss and doors will open where there were no doors before. So follow your passion. Uh, Deepak, if you could give advice to a young person in their 20s who is incredibly sensitive, self-aware, and in their, in, their, in their inner life, who has an innate sense of purpose to how they want and need to ser serve the world, but still working on the courage to do it, what advice would you give them? That's such a great question. Ask it on June 1st and we'll record it with you for the Oprah Winfrey Show. <laughs> um, these are long questions. I, I just would like to uh, maybe end this and uh, first of all say thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing yourselves. Thank you for inviting us into your consciousness for this conversation. I'd like to thank you for inviting me to be part of this. And I, um, I wish you tremendous success on your, on your continued journeys. And I look forward to your event. And I really want to say thank you for everyone here, everyone watching. 
Thanks for opening up and sharing a part of yourself with us tonight. It's great to have you here on stage. Thank, Thank you very you much. Sir. Thank you, Jeff. It's a great honor to be here.